Amen. Love that song, that last song. Some of you may not have known it. That comes way back from the archives. Uh, I remember singing that over in Bradley on Broadway uh, back in the old church. So, excellent message. I'd like to start out with a word of prayer if we could. God, I thank you for your word that it is true. God, I thank you for your spirit that takes things from your word, God, and applies it to our hearts and lives and makes it personal and usable that we can use daily. Lord, I pray that you would speak today and, Lord, that I would step out of the way, Lord, that you would just have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I always count it a privilege to, to come and speak. Um, this scares me to death whenever I come up here. I just want you to know. I, I uh, avoided public speaking in college because I was scared. <laughs> and then yet the Lord still somehow finds ways to, uh, to use us, even though it's not necessarily our uh, favorite thing in life, right? And uh, so all he wants us to do is be faithful. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about what it means to pass the torch to the next generation. I enjoy history a lot. I enjoy reading Joshua. He's my, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And how God used him to lead the people of Israel after Moses passed, uh, Joshua stepped up and, and God used him to bring the people of Israel into the promised land. And I remember the story of, of them coming up to the Jordan River and uh, God parted the waters of the Jordan River and as the whole nation of Israel walked through, uh, basically through the river on dry land, um, God said, I want you to put some stones on the bank and, uh, so that you can remember what I've done through you. And, and so God used <clears throat> those stones as a memorial so that they could look back and remember, uh, remember Egypt, remember how God brought them through uh, all of the famine, uh, all of the, the plagues, excuse me, and, and all of the things that were going on in, in Egypt and, and how God found uh, was, was faithful in whatever situation that they were in. And then Jericho, how they marched around the city uh, six straight days. And then the seventh day, they marched around seven times. And that the, the walls of Jericho fell in. And, and they went in and overtook the city. Just God's power just shown in, in amazing might. And then I'd like to pick up, uh, actually, and then shortly after that, it seemed like... Joshua was still getting some pushback from the people of Israel. It's amazing how the devil will continue to try to pull and try to deceive and try to um, just draw us away from God. And, and even with a strong leader as Joshua was, I mean, Joshua even had to come to the point, he says, I don't know what the rest of you guys are doing, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. He says, I'm going to stand. That's just the way it's going to be. And then all of a sudden, all the, you know, the rest of them followed. And, and it was just amazing how God used Joshua. And I'm going to pick up with Judges chapter 2, verse 6. And there's several verses here, but it's, it's very important what's said here. It says, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnaharaz in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that, the whole generation that had been gathered had been gathered to their ancestors. It means they passed away. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. 
Now, I'm not sure what the problem was there. It doesn't really talk about it. But it, it's almost like there is total amnesia in the lives of these kids that are growing up through this. It's like they're not really seeing what's going on. I mean, they're seeing it, but it's not really taking heart. They're, they're experiencing the power of God, but it's not really resonating within them. It says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who, were, who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Notice that when you decide to go your own way, that God's hand of protection and blessing leaves. All of a sudden, you are a direct target for the enemy and his destruction. And that's what happened here. He sold them into the hands of all their enemies all around. They were no longer able to resist. Whoever, excuse me, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he has sworn to them. They were in great distress. You know, God understands that sometimes the only way that we can come back to him is he has to get our attention. And that involves a lot of pain. And I know that it hurts God when it causes us pain, but if it will draw us unto him, then it's a good thing. Verse 16 says, Then the Lord raised up judges, who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. Notice that God still always has compassion and mercy. What an amazing God that we serve. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the co covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed these nations to remain he did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. I would say that that story is very applicable to us, very applicable to this generation, very applicable to our nation. The American dream has always been that if only we can make things easier for our kids where they can have a foot up or an, or an advantage. It, the ideal that every U.S. citizen should have an equal opportunity to achieve success and prosperity through hard work, determination, and initiative. That was the American dream. If you can only work hard, you can get there, right? That's the message. Well, what does Jesus say? He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his own soul? What does it profit? So today I want to talk about not passing on the American dream to your kids, but passing on the, the torch, the, the heritage of Christ living in you to your kids. The Declaration of Independence talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have three problems that are, that's going on. It's three things that are stopping us from passing on this heritage, this Christian heritage to our kids. 
relevancy. What does that mean? What is the life that God saved you from? Some of us could stand up here right now and give a testimony and say how the life that they used to live before Christ was horrible and that you lived in lots and lots of pain and how God rescued you and changed you and turned you around and now you feel God's blessing on you and you, and you know that someday you will be in heaven with him. What an amazing testimony. I don't really have that testimony. I grew up in a Christian family. I was blessed with that. I didn't understand what it meant to, to uh, feel the pain of sin and making wrong choices and, and broken relationships. And I'm thankful for that. But, you know, my relationship with God is may, I may not have that sense of commitment to Christ because I don't really know. I, I, I haven't personally experienced the, the garbage that he saved me from, if that makes sense to you. Sometimes we will raise our kids up and they will feel that same thing where, well, I, it just seems like the good thing to do. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, Jesus is there and yeah, we, we need to have a relationship with him. But it's just, it's like on a surface level. It's not our own. It's not something that goes deep within who we are. relationship. Sometimes our relationship with our kids is, is a little bit distant. I don't know about you, but they think a little bit differently than we did. I don't know about, uh, I mean, for me, I remember my son saying, Dad, it, it just seems like all you're doing is, is, is obeying a bunch of rules and that I can never measure up to. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm sorry. I don't know. I didn't know that I was portraying that. Because I want to, what I want to portray is that the reason why I choose some of the things that I choose, I choose to do things that please God, is because I love God. Because I want to please Him. Because I'm thankful for all that He's done for me. But yet my son, was, he wasn't really experiencing that. And so now, after he's uh, a few years later, he's been able to share that. He says, you know, my faith is my own. He says, um, God has grabbed a hold of my heart and showed me his grace. But sometimes our relationships with our kids are sometimes not to that point where our kids really want to take on what we are, if that makes sense. Sometimes we need to develop that personal touch with our kids, spend that special time with our kids, get to know them, make sure that they know that you would do anything for them, as long as it pleases God, of course. Sometimes we, our kids will obey us because they know that we would beat the tar out of them if they don't, right? <laughs> I mean, I grew up with that. I mean, I, I, I did not want the, uh, the other side of that. But, but you know what? I also learned that my dad loved me. And my dad, and, and I, I respected what he said because he, he would always speak honestly to me. And... I wanted what he had because I saw what it did in his life. And before you know it, I was obeying God or obeying my parents because I had the same conviction that they had. And so I was, I was taking on the same heritage that they passed on to me. Now, I want you to know that in this day and age of technology and smartphones and, and all of that stuff, I'm telling you that, that the world is getting less and less personal. There is less and less human interaction, and that is hurting our kids. It really is. Our, our kids are, I mean, have you ever, 
driven by like a, a restaurant and you see like a whole family and they're all on their phones um, and not, they're not talking with each other. They're like, you know, texting with whoever. You go, wow. It's a strange world in which we live in. Our kids are constantly looking at our lives and trying to decide, are they for real? Are they, is this a genuine thing? Or are, they just, or are they just going through the motions? Are they just putting on a show so that on Sundays you can have your nice little smile? Is this real? And that's what your kids are doing, looking at you constantly. But I tell you what, you know, the, the best time when your kids can see the way you are is in the middle of the fire. When things are going horrible, that's when your kids are going to see truly who you are. They're going to decide what is genuine and what is not. You know, if you really think about it, in, in some ways, we are all actually hypocrites. We say one thing and we do something else. The Apostle Paul, he says in Romans seven fourteen, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And now this is a wild scripture here, so hang with me here. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do what the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Doesn't this really give you a true assessment of where we are? Without Christ we are nothing. We see what he wants us to do. And yet it's bringing our will into submission to his will. That's the problem that I have. I know what he wants me to do, but sometimes I want to do what I want to do. And that's a problem. And so then God will take circumstances in my life and smack me around a little bit so that all of a sudden, at whatever point, I can say, God, what you want is what matters. What I want doesn't matter at all. Sometimes when we are older, like me, and we make a lot of the rules, sometimes we think that we might be above the law. And in doing that, we're a bad example to our kids. They said, well, I have to do this. Why aren't you doing that, Dad? I think that right now in our culture and in our society that our kids are more attacked than ever before. I think that in, in our schools, the, the kind of garbage that's coming and attacking our families, it's, it's, it's disgusting to me. Amen. When I think of vulnerable children being attacked with out and out lies from the devil 
as to who they are and how God created them, it makes me puke. And then when I think about how our society also feels that a teacher or a counselor has more authority and more wisdom about your kids than you do, I have a problem with that. So our kids are under attack. And we have to realize that God gave us the calling to teach our kids. And you might say, Pastor Brad, that's, what I, that's why I hire, hire teachers to teach my kids. No, ultimately we are the ones who are to teach our kids. And so if, you are, if your kids are coming under teaching that is contrary to what you are teaching at home, then I would think seriously about what you should do about that. Because there's a lot of teaching out there that is contrary to the word of God. There are not more than 60-some genders out there. Amen. There aren't. There are two. And your doctor did not guess what you should be when you were born or what you were be when you were born. And leave it up to a, a little three or four year old. Oh, I think I feel like this or I think I feel like that. No, Johnny, you're a boy. I understand that there's a school that has kitty litter in the bathroom because there's a girl that identifies as a cat. I wouldn't be surprised if they put a fire hydrant in the boys' restroom <laughs> for, for somebody that would identify as a dog, right? I mean, and, and, and you know, and, and we chuckle about this, but I'm telling you, this stuff is going on in our nation. And I want to be careful about what I say, okay? But we have to, as, as believers, we have to take the responsibility that God has given us to teach our children, and not only that, to teach each other. Our older believers have to be taking younger believers under our wing and teaching them about what is true. Our young people are forming their, their whole structure of who they are and where they fit into God's creation is being formed at a young age. And if they hear lies and confusion, there's only one author of confusion, and that is the devil. And that's why God needs us to step up and to take the rightful spot that we have in affecting a generation for him. In Deuteronomy... Actually, no, you know what? I'm going to, before I do that, we're going to show a little video. And this is a home, home video that my mom took back in the 60s. Okay, so there's no sound. Super 8, a couple of you guys might remember that format. <laughs> um, but basically, this is a picture of my father, and my dad was my hero. And his name was Art. And he was a well driller, but he's teaching me how to ride my bike. All right? Now, you also will see another little man flying by with a wheelbarrow uh, and also on a tricycle a little bit later. That's my brother Brent, okay? And then you'll see another little guy that is my brother Rick, and he's just little, just enjoying the show, okay? So we're going to go ahead and put this on. Like I said, there's no sound. But there's my dad. I was scared to death. <laughs> but you know, dad always said, I'll be there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll be there. I said, what if I fall down? I'll be there. And that, was, and that was a, thank you, and that was a, a real picture of who my dad was. He was the guy that 
before I'd go to bed, he would, he would slip in and, and spend some time with me, and he'd talk with me, and he'd pray with me. Um, he was, he was, would constantly show his love for me. And, and just that picture, whatever it was, whether it was hard times or not, he was there, and he was there to support me. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter, or there are several different verses that I'd like to read, and it talks about how God has called each one of us to teach. 414, it says, and I don't have the verses up on the screen, but it says, and the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. 531, but you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land that I am given them to possess. 61, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Deuteronomy 11:19, teach them to your children talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. 1711, act according to whatever they teach you and the decisions they give you. Do not turn aside from what they tell you to the right or to the left. 2018, otherwise they will teach you to follow all the detestable things that they do in worshiping their gods and you will sin against, and you will sin against the Lord your God. 32.2, let my teaching fall like rain and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. And in scripture, it continually talks about how we are to teach, teach, and teach. You might say, Pastor Brad, I'm not a teacher. Well, I think it's talking more about the, than the, the actual calling of, of teacher here or the gift of teaching. This is our influence on people that are around us. We need to share our past. We need to be open and honest with our kids. We need to let them know that we are sinners saved by grace. We are nothing without him. 1 Timothy 1.15, here is a trustworthy st- saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display this immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You see, hard times and struggles, we all go through them. And part of the problem is, is that we've learned through our struggles, and many times our kids don't go through those same struggles. When you go through a struggle, you develop character, and your commitment to Christ gets that much stronger. When your kids don't have to go through a lot of those struggles, they don't develop that inner character, that inner love for their Savior, and thereby having the opportunity to draw closer to God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to show our kids that. We need to give credit where it is due. Good things only come from God. There's nothing that we are without him. Everything that is good comes from God. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. If you ever think that you have it all figured out and that you're just waiting for <laughs> and you're just waiting for that day when Jesus calls you home and everything's all cool and easy, um, get ready to fall because pride goes before a fall. Have you ever thought that you're better than someone else? That's pride. That's of the enemy. That can destroy relationship has the blessing of God ever went to your head we go wow God is really blessing me here whoa God is really blessing me there wow I'm pretty cool Um, that's pride don't let that happen we are not entitled God does not owe us anything keep the most 
Keep most important what is most important, and that is God's business. I remember my dad just speaking into our lives and saying, all the other things that you can do in life are basically worthless. But if whatever you do for Christ, that's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that you will be able to uh, have reward in heaven for is what you do for him. Money is a tool. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Mark 8.36 says, What good is it, and we referred to this earlier, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet to forfeit their soul? It's important that we meet with God's people. I'm so thankful that we can get together weekly and see each other, encourage one another. Hebrews 10.25 says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We need each other more and more. As, as things get ratcheted up here towards the end of the, the age, towards the day that Jesus comes, we need each other and to encourage one another and to even teach one another what God has shown us. Read God's love letter. That's the Bible. Talk to him. That's prayer. You say, Pastor Brad, all of the things that you're saying here sounds like a really good idea. But my kid does not respect me. In fact, my kid thinks that I'm old and weird. That could be true. That could be true. But I want you to know I want you to know that God still wants to use you. If your kids see a genuine heart that loves them, that cares for them, and you want the very best for them, they're going to really hear you. Maybe not immediately. Maybe they have to go through some hard things before they will. But I want you to know, just as the, the man came back to, the, or the prodigal son came back to his father. Be ready to receive your child that right now they're not hearing you, but that one day God's going to bring them to the point where they're, they're at, the, at, at the end of their rope and they're going to need a loving father or a loving mother to restore them back to relationship. And then at that point, they're going to hear what you have to say. Love unconditionally, but discipline consistently. I want to talk to our younger generation now here as I close. I know a lot of you guys. We are blessed with a lot of great kids here in this church. I want you to know that. And I'm very thankful for you. And I want you to know that the older, the older generation... We're not perfect. I want you to know that all of us are saved by grace and have our faults and we need Jesus every day. But I also want you to know that God has a plan for you. And it's not even necessarily to influence a church in the future. But actually what God wants to do is to even use you now in your youth. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Young people, hang in there with your parents. They're not going to get it right all the time. But the principles that they're trying to abide by, those will remain true. God's word is true, and it will continue to be true for you. You might, not, you might see some incons inconsistencies in your, the lives of your parents, but that doesn't change the truth that God has. 
Follow that with all that you are, and God will bless you, okay? You are not the church of tomorrow, but yet you're the church of today. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the calling that you placed on each one of us, Father, to influence a younger generation, but Lord, even to influence each other for you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just well up within us. Father God, that we would be the vessels that you have called us to be. And Lord, that you would just anoint us to make a huge, amazing difference on the people around us. Father, so that all that is said and all that is done would point them to you. And we thank you for this day. Bless each one that's here. I pray that you would anoint your words and use it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have elders that are going to be here for prayer. God bless you. Have a great day.